There are many ecosystems around the Long Island Sound, but few are as distinct as the salt marsh. These tidal wetlands are home to a wide array of species found nowhere else, and are crucial to the health of the Sound and its shorelines. Let's explore why. So we're here uh, on Kokini Island in Westport. This is part of the Norwalk Island chain. And we're standing in a salt marsh that's on the back side of a pretty large lagoon here. Now, this makes sense. A, a lot of the places we see salt marshes around here are on the kind of the muddy margins of pretty still bodies of water. Uh, there's a couple of reasons for this. Um, and it's kind of a positive feedback loop. So salt marshes generally form when there's uh, slow, sediment-rich, shallow water, and the formation of a salt marsh also traps more sediment in that water, uh, further developing the marsh. Marshes can only form atop these thick coastal sediments, and on the rocky shore of the Long Island Sound, they therefore are limited in their size. Here, marshes are most often found at river mouths or along shorelines with little wave action, where sediment can build up without being washed away. So salt marshes are some of the most productive ecosystems we have in this area. And more so than that, they provide a ton of uh, really indispensable roles uh, for local ecosystem functions, right? So this right here is one of the more common salt marsh plants and kind of forms the entire foundation of the local ecosystem. This is what we call salt marsh cord grass. Its Latin name is Spartina alterniflora. Now, this grass is uniquely adapted to grow in super saline or super salty soils. It sprouts up from a rhizome in the mud. What that means, though, is that each fall and winter, all of this fleshy, visible part of the grass that you can see here dies out. And then all of that leftover organic material, which has sequestered a ton of carbon and nutrients throughout the summer, uh, is breaking, broken down uh, by decomposers and various different organisms, and then washed out into the sound with fall and winter tides. And what you get here then is a massive replenishing of local nutrients. Cordgrass only grows in low areas of the marsh, below the high tide line. It depends on the cycling of the tides to bring in fresh nutrients while clearing away debris that could otherwise prevent its growth. At the same time, the grass cannot survive being fully submerged. This sets limits on where cordgrass can grow, and thus where salt marshes can develop. At higher elevations in the marsh, where flooding is infrequent, soils are still quite salty and a whole other host of marsh plants grow. This is called high salt marsh. Here you might find salt hay and sea lavender, shown here. Salt marshes are an essential buffer zone, absorbing the tide and their spongy sediments and keeping upper reaches dry. They are especially good at reducing the damage caused by storm surges when they occur. Salt marshes also play an important role as a nursery for many marine species. Among their sheltered channels and shallow, sh slow-moving waters, the young of the sound sporting fish find safety away from open water predators. Certain species of small fish spend their entire lives in the water of and around the marsh, and countless invertebrates call the marsh home as well, nurturing an extensive food web. Let's meet some of the players. Almost as common as cord grass in the salt marsh are ribbed mussels, which also help stabilize the shifting sediments they attach to. At each high tide, the countless mussels in the marsh open and filter the water passing through, removing planktonic prey and pollutants. They help clean the sound. Another abundant invertebrate is the Atlantic marsh fiddler crab. These crabs are well known and easily recognizable due to the, due to the male's large claw, which they use for display purposes in order to attract a mate. The crabs feed on algae and decaying plant matter and dig extensive networks of burrow in the mud that they retreat into when predators are around. These burrows allow oxygen and nutrient-rich water deep into the soils, helping the cord grass to grow, so fiddler crabs play a unique role in maintaining the ecosystem. Even though they make a valiant effort to avoid predators, fiddler crabs are just one of many prey species that allow a diverse array of birds to flourish in salt marsh ecosystems. Some of the most obvious are the large waders, including several species of herons and egrets. These waders also feed on fish, alongside top predators like the osprey. Not all salt marsh birds are large predators, however, and some songbirds are uniquely adapted for a life among the grass and reeds. This includes the salt marsh sparrow, which can only be found in healthy salt marsh ecosystems on the Atlantic coast. The rich muds of the marsh are also important for migratory shorebirds, many of whom stop over to feed in spring and fall. In this mud, a whole host of tiny invertebrates thrive, breaking down organic matter, 
and these birds have specialized to feed on them. Truly, every inch of the marsh supports life. One star of salt marsh's wildlife is the diamondback terrapin, a beautiful species of turtle that is uniquely adapted for a saltwater lifestyle. They aren't sea turtles and retain clawed feet for movement over land, but they can drink salt water and pursue primarily saltwater prey like clams, periwinkles, and mud snails. Salt marshes are their preferred habitat, and you can often see their patterned heads poking up from water between the grass. So these guys are actually a somewhat threatened species here in the state of Connecticut. These guys are deemed endangered in the state of Rhode Island and threatened in Massachusetts. Here in Connecticut, they're not actually listed, but they're still a species of real conservation concern. So these guys historically were actually hunted a lot and their nests were dug up. These guys lay their eggs in the ground. Uh, their eggs were dug up for food and the turtles themselves were hunted for a specialty, turtle soup, which people still eat some places. Today, that's less of a threat but these guys still do face problems from getting caught in crab traps and drowning. Obviously, as a reptile, they do have to come up for air. Um, and they also, as they cross roads in coastal areas, uh, to and from nests or to and from different areas in the marsh, they're frequently hit by cars. So if you ever see a terrapin on a roadside uh, here in coastal Connecticut, please do stop and escort it over to the other side of the road. You'll be doing a real help to this species. And I mean, this guy is just unbelievably adorable. How can you not want to help him out? For all their importance to human and natural communities, historically, marshes received little protection. Many were filled in or drained for coastal development and to combat mosquitoes. Today, most remaining marshes are protected and managed, like the ones shown here in eastern Connecticut. Still, these marshes face threats from pollution, rising sea levels, and invasive species like the Phragmites reed. These reeds can completely take over a native ecosystem, negatively impacting the marsh wildlife and ecosystem services. Thankfully, marshes are now recognized for their vital role, and many people and organizations are working to protect and restore them. Next time you're out around a salt marsh, take some time to reflect on all the good they do, and keep an eye out for the wonderful wildlife who call the marsh home.